the male, you know, the guy would be like, you know what, Dr. Steph, this is the best. Like, I just like this week I dropped like 10 pounds. And, you know, the, the wife is sitting here going like, we've had the same food. We've been doing the same activity and I've dropped two. What you teach is first we are, you are doing strict ketosis. You're resetting the hormones. You're teaching your cells to burn fat instead of sugar. And then you practice this keto cycling. Your period is basically your hormonal report card for the month. And what I would want, what I want women to learn, if there's nothing else that you learn from our, from this conversation or um, from any of my teachings is that your menstrual cycle, like, so your bleed week is going to tell you about the hormonal status that you have in your body. I always speak about competition and how you should not compare yourself against anybody else. It's these small little tweaks that I believe lead to giant peaks and it doesn't have to be go big or go home. We want to be able to be able to identify some of these common patterns that happen in the female population as it relates to hormonal derangement and dysfunction and be able to appropriately respond to her. Hey Keto Camper, Ben Azadi here, best-selling author of three books, founder of Keto Camp. I'm super excited to bring on Dr. Stephanie Estima to talk all things keto for the ladies out there. Dr. Stephanie Estima is a leading authority in women's health, and we're going to discuss some very interesting topics today, what your period says about your health. Dr. Estima calls it your hormonal report card, and she says, quote, your period is the lasso of truth. Then we're gonna get into her new book, which by the way, comes out tomorrow called The Betty Body and why she wrote the book, what the book's about, and you have the opportunity to click the link down below and pre-order that book. And then we deep dive into the menstrual cycle and she gives you such a brilliant breakdown week by week on how to customize your keto and fasting and exercise approach according to your cycle. So week one should be different than week two, and week three, and week four, every week is gonna be different, and she outlines it so brilliantly. I was actually so inspired by her that I put a lot of her research into my new book called Keto Flex, which is coming out soon, where I wrote an entire chapter on keto and fasting for the ladies out there, and a lot of the information in that book is from this conversation. And then we don't forget about you ladies out there who are postmenopausal. How do you do keto and fasting if you're postmenopausal? She'll explain what happens with your hormones, how to support your hormones and how to do it the right way, how to listen to your body, how to track your monthly cycle, and so much more. This is a, a gift for all the women out there. And if you're not a woman, you're still gonna get value from this because you know a woman in your life and you could understand them better. Uh, personally, I know I'm not a woman, but I get so much information from this because I can educate my female clients. I understand my mom more, my girlfriend more, and all the ladies in my life. So it's important to understand their hormones, they're unique, they're beautiful, and this explains it all for you today. Dr. Stephanie Estima is a big-hearted chiropractor with a special interest in functional neurology, brain optimization, and weight loss. She studied neuroscience and psychology before becoming a doctor of chiropractic. She has been in private practice for over 16 years in Toronto, Canada, and but she educates all across the world. She has her Better Podcast, which I'm gonna be on very soon. Her show is about high-performing women who wanna have a better body, better mind, better relationships, better sex, and better family. So without further ado, here is Dr. Stephanie Estima. Get ready to geek out like we did on this episode. Dr. Stephanie Estima, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. I am thrilled to be here, Ben. I think we're gonna have a really fun conversation today. We were just geeking out offline and we were just chatting away seven minutes, eight minutes, and we, we gotta hit record and get this conversation started. I love what you're doing. Your work is so good. You go so deep into the science and you have some great analogies. So we're gonna talk, this episode's gonna be focused all around keto and fasting for women, but if you're a guy watching or listening, this applies to you as well because your partner, your friend, you, you know somebody who's a woman who's doing keto and you could actually help educate them and understand them better. So we'll get to that. But I want to start with your story. Uh, I know a little bit of your background and your training, but what got you involved with what you're doing today, Stephanie? 
Uh, well, I think that I started off like many people in the keto space, very interested in the diet and the effects that it can have on brain health and brain metabolism and clarity of thought and focus. And my training is as a chiropractor and in my private practice, I had a special interest in functional neurology. So when the keto diet started getting more notoriety, I was very excited about this proxy for helping with brain health. And in my, you know, in sort of the early days of my keto experience, I did keto just like everyone else did. You know, it was like the bacon, butter, burgers, and repeat, right? It was like the tubs of sour cream and all that. And I started noticing a pattern with my patients in the clinic. I was running, um, my patients were kind enough to let, to be my guinea pigs. And I was, you know, formulating a plan. And what I started noticing, and we were just chatting about this in the pre-chat, was husband and wife couples that would do it together. The male, you know, the guy would be like, you know what, Dr. Steph, this is the best. Like, I just like this week I dropped like 10 pounds. And you know, the, the wife is sitting here going like, we've had the same food. We've been doing the same activity and I've dropped two. Right. So at first I was like, oh, she must be, you know, not following it. Maybe she's, you know, checking in some like, you know, sneaking in some snacks or something. And then that pattern kept repeating enough for me to say, okay, something is going on here. There's a pattern uh, between men and women uh, that are different. And so I started, you know, and there's a whole backstory. I don't know how long you would like me to go into this, but I myself personally, even though I was doing the keto diet, got great results in terms of my own like focus and productivity and how I felt it changed my body. I was also in the background dealing with a lot of menstrual issues. So like my, my period very openly and honestly and transparently was just like a gong show for, for if I'm being totally honest, like decades. And I really, as, as someone who really valued, um, you know, successes in terms of like degrees and knowledge and, you know, running a successful clinic, I always would treat myself like men. I would do keto like the guys would. I would see some of my, you know, mentors, whether that's up close or from afar, um, go jumping into a five day fast. And I would say, well, like if Mark Sisson is going to do that, like, I want to do that. I want to do a five day fast. And, um, obviously Mark Sisson is not a, a woman, you know, but I am. So I would jump into those things and I would force my body, force my physiology to follow this without any, you know, consideration for, you know, my menstrual cycle or that I was a woman. I, I like to forget that. And, um, it really wasn't until, uh, for me personally, anyway, I had a trip over into Europe, um, several years ago and, I was in Italy with my family and my friends and, um, on that trip towards the end of it, we were there for several weeks and, and towards the end of it, I got my period. And normally that would be like the worst thing. Like I'd be in the hotel room with the Advil, with the eye mask on, like no one talked to me, but it was the most graceful and peaceful and just honestly glorious. Like it just kind of came in, she did her thing and then she left. And you know, at first you might, when you hear that, you might say, well, it's Italy, like everything's better in Italy, right? <laughs> like, you know, like the coffee's better, the pizza's, better, everything's better. But I, I also knew there was a part of me that also knew that if I, if my body could do it in Europe, you know, it could also do it in North America. Like I could also bring it back home and figure out what were some of the environmental uh, you know, key players and what were some of the internal uh, environmental key players that I could be manipulating to help make this a reality. Um, so, you know, kind of went, you know, with my patients, like my guinea pigs, as I said, tried to play around with this idea of uh, keto cycling in accordance with your menstrual cycle, which is now sort of my, you know, big body of work. And what I want everyone to learn is that women, of course you can do keto. Of course there can be a therapeutic, intervention, I like to say a 28 day or, you know, like one full cycle of like pure ketosis. And then from there, we can start to modulate your macronutrients so that you are matching it up with where you are, um, in your cycle. And, you know, I'm really happy to say that that was my 
trip to Italy was several years ago. And I am, I look forward to my, I love my menstrual cycle now. It's something that I used to feel like was my arch nemesis. It was like a punishment for being a woman. And now it's just something that I celebrate. It feels great. I feel wonderful all times of the month. There's no PMS. There's no, you know, bloating. There's no sleep disorder, any of the things that women typically deal with. And I really want to share this with, you know, not only my patients who benefited from this and I have, but with, with the world. Mm, I love that. You know, um, I love that you were the first guinea pig in your patients. Yes, it was pig. originally an N of one, but then it, it expanded into my practice. Yeah. <laughs> so you, what you teach is first we are, you are doing strict ketosis. You're resetting the hormones. You're teaching your cells to burn fat instead of sugar. And then you practice this keto cycling and we're going to get into different variations and what time during the cycle, during uh, away from the cycle, we want to do specific things. We're also going to talk about perimenopausal and postmenopausal. So we're not forgetting about you ladies. No. Be mm. Before we get into that, talk more about, speak more about uh, a quote here. Bleed is your hormonal report card. Yes. <laughs> so what is what does your period say about your health? What are some specific things that it says? Yeah. So um, it, actually, I have a in in my book. Uh, we it's called the Betty Body Chapter. I believe it's in Chapter Three. I call it. You know, your period is the lasso of truth. So of course, there's like a Wonder Woman reference there because I love Wonder Woman, and it's true. Your period is basically your hormonal report card for the month. And what I would want, what I want women to learn, if there's nothing else that you learn is, from our from this conversation or um, from any of my teachings is that your menstrual cycle, like so your bleed week is going to tell you about the hormonal status that you have in your body. So very similar to, and there, there have been institutions that have designated your menstrual cycle as a vital sign for women. So in the same way that if you were to go to a hospital, uh, they would look at your respiratory rate, they would look at your oxygen saturation, they would look at your blood pressure. For women, I think what is also important that we need to be considering is our uh, another vital sign that we have that tells us about the integrity and balance in our female uh, physiology is our menstrual cycle. So if you have very heavy bleeding, if you have a lot of clotting, if the week before your period you are, you know, you have sleep disturbances or you are are moody and irritable. If you find that um, your your digestion, if you are very you know bloated and distended, your bowel movements are not moving the way that they should. Uh, if you're finding that you uh, you know your rings aren't fitting the way that they should, that you're bloated and all of that kind of stuff, those are si signs and symptoms that your body is trying to tell you that your that things may not be uh, completely balanced. That there's something that's gone awry, and my hope is that women are going to stop looking at their symptoms as, you know, punishment or that there's something wrong with you, but rather it is your body's way of talking. Like how great would it be if your liver could just send you a text and be like, Hey, there's like too many processed carbohydrates, girl. Like, can you like ease up on it? No, like that's not how our liver, you know, but we, but we have to learn to attune to the language of our body. So when your symptoms are presenting as sleep disturbances, mood and irritability, bloating and distension, et cetera, we can learn to say, okay, maybe that means that I might have a little bit, there's, you know, unopposed estrogen in the luteal phase of my cycle. And we can talk about what that means, or maybe I am, if I'm not regular enough, uh, or I have, you know, uh, hormonal, if I have like, you know, thick hair in my, on my chin or on my chest, or I'm losing hair in my temples, that might be a sign that my body's telling me that there's too much testosterone and whether that's not being aromatized to estrogen or, or what have you, um, we, we want to be able to be able to identify some of these common patterns that happen in the female population as it relates to hormonal derangement and dysfunction and be able to appropriately respond to her. Mm, that's so empowering. You know, my, my girlfriend, Natasia, she, when we first started dating five, over five years ago, she was on the birth control pill. And the reason her doctor put her on the birth control pill since she was a teenager was because of her painful periods. But right. that's putting a Band-Aid. Why not look at why, the cause of it? And when you could attack the cause. So eventually, you know, I, I shared some information. I, I educated and she got off of it. And she was able to reduce her insulin spikes, reduce her glucose spike, do some intermittent fasting, and the periods improved. 
and, and that was so empowering for her. And what you're sharing is so empowering for anybody who's listening, who has a cycle and who gets all those symptoms every single month. That is not a requirement. You don't, you could have it like uh, Dr. Stephanie said, it could be a pleasant experience where right. every month you don't have to dread it. It doesn't have to destroy you. You could continue on with your life. So I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, that would be pretty cool for a liver, the, the soccer mom organ liver. <laughs> if you're like, Hey, what's up with all that alcohol, man? You're beating me up. Yeah. 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 I need a break. Cut it down, cut down with the Chablis. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so you mentioned briefly that uh, you have a new book out and uh, yeah. everything that you're going to be teaching today is from the book and you have it in a step-by-step system. Correct. So it's actually coming out tomorrow, one day from today. Speak a little bit about the book and then where they could go and order it. Sure. So the book is called The Betty Body. And you might be thinking like, what, who is Betty and why is it a Betty Body? Um, I, like you, Ben, I have a podcast. Uh, the podcast is called Better. And we started calling the fans of Better our Bettys. So, you know, tends to, we have a big female audience. Uh, a lot of clinicians listen to the, to the pod as well. And we just started calling our fans Bettys. And it was interesting that it, it, was, it was unintentional, but it became the sort of sticky name. We had people reviewing the podcast, let's say on iTunes or what have you. And they would say, I'm a Betty too. I'm so happy to be a Betty and I want to be a Betty. And so I was like, Oh, there's something, there's something here. So I named the book after, uh, all the women who are, you know, they want to double down on learning and learning how to be better. And it's not about being perfect. That's the other thing. So I, I tend to attract the type A personality, you know, overachieving woman, because that's who I am. <laughs> you know, that's like my own, you know, healing journey is to sort of shed that perfectionism, um, cloak that I have, that I've held on to for so long. And it's not, and that's actually why I named the podcast better, not best. You know, it's like, it's just about what can I do tomorrow or today that's going to make just like move me like a squeak like just like a little nanometer you know a forward um you know because that's what it's all about right in terms of you know we all want to maybe you know a goal might be to lose weight but it's the learning about yourself during the weight loss process that actually is the thing that keeps the weight loss sustainable it's not about doing the 600 calorie you know diet and you're working out for 3 hours a day like no one's going to be able to maintain that right so i really want to think about how we can play uh, the long game with women and so the betty body and then the subtitle uh my favorite i shared it with you uh, before it's epic, uh, epic. sure way <laughs> a kiki goddess's guide to balanced hormones, intuitive eating, and transformative sex. Everybody wants that. <laughs> yeah, everyone wants that. And well, th and this is the other thing, you know, we can, you know, maybe we don't talk about it on this podcast, but in the book, I talk about how the, you know, sex and orgasms and just the pursuit of pleasure, whether it's sexual or otherwise, is a very important thing for women to consider. Again, when we talk about vitals, like you have an orgasm, all of your vitals improve, right? Heart rate improves, like respiratory rate improves, oxygen sap Im improves, all the things improve. Your, you know, your pain tolerance, if you're someone who has, you know, pain and men like menstrual cramping, like right ahead of your uh, bleed week, you know, having an orgasm has actually been shown to reduce your perception of that pain because it increases your pain tolerance. So there's, even though, we, yeah, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of ways that we talk about female specific ways that we can improve our hormonal report card, which is, which is our period. Yeah. Hormonal report card. Well, I love that. Um, I love what you shared about better, uh, and the Bettys. It's so, so cool that they, that you have that, that community. Um, and you're so right. I always talk about and then we have the keto campers here, right? You have the Bettys, we have the keto campers. I, love that. I, yeah. I was talking about, I always speak about competition and how you should not compare yourself against anybody else. You know, real people who are world-class, who are getting amazing results, they don't compete against anybody except who they were yesterday. They just beat yesterday. They are a small percentage better each day, like you were mentioning. And it's these small little tweaks that I believe lead to giant peaks. And it doesn't have to be go big or go home. You know, I, I love going big and I love having big goals, but it's really these small tweaks that get you there. And it's really not about hitting the goal, at least for me, it's about who I have to become, the people I need to help throughout that journey of hitting the goal. So our message re resonates with each other so much because I am all for that. And uh, I can't wait to be on your podcast, the better uh, podcast very, very soon. And, I can't uh, wait. Yeah. yeah. And uh, where's the best place to get the book, by the way, before we continue? Oh, you can, I mean, you can get it on Amazon. You can go to bettybodybook.com, you know, anywhere where you buy, you know, you might buy books online is going to be available there. 
Awesome. So if you're listening to the podcast on the release day of the podcast, it's coming out tomorrow, but you could pre-order it today. Yeah. We'll put all the links and resources down below. We have Rachel. Shout out to Rachel, who's on our team, who puts all, the, all that together for us. Okay, let's get into Keto for Women. Let's talk about the cycling women. What are some things to consider? Go as deep and geeky as you'd like for the cycling women doing Amazing. keto. Amazing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the permission to geek out. That's great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so when we think about women who are still in their reproductive years, so they are, and this includes perimenopausal women as well, we want to be thinking about some of the different hormonal variations or the ever-changing hormonal milieu through these four weeks. And I say four weeks, understanding that some women may not be exactly seven, like we not, some of us are not exactly 28 day cyclers. You may be 29, 30, 32, 26, 27, you know, I'm, I'm breaking it up just for simplicity in terms of seven days. Okay. So when we think about the first week of our cycle, this is usually the onset of the bleed, right? So this is the bleed week. And when we think about the hormonal landscape here, we know that most hormones have gone on vacation. So we have estrogen very low, testosterone is not there. We have uh, luteinizing hormone. She's gone like the only progesterone's on vacation. The only hormone that is really still around is follicular stimulating hormone and FSH as it's abbreviated follicular stimulating hormone, FSH. Uh, her job is is really just to continue to develop the follicle because there's going to be one lucky follicle, you know, one lucky egg that is going to be, um, released or developed that month for release. So this is a wonderful week for a traditional ketogenic uh, macronutrient breakdown. So I, the way that I structure keto, and it might be very similar to yours, Ben, I'm not sure, but for, for women, I do, I don't like the bacon, butter and burger and repeat, right? I really do like there to be um, a lot of plant-based. So when I'm, when you're sort of formulating and building your plate, you should see a plate of green leafy vegetables ideally. So a lot of cruciferous vegetables, I talk a lot about the brassica family and the, um, the value that, you know, consuming things like cauliflower and bok choy and broccoli and turnips, all of, all of this huge breath, like the sulforaphanes and there's compounds inside uh, the brassica family that actually help with estrogen, um, help the liver to detox, help with estrogen elimination. So for a woman, a classical ketogenic protocol for her in that first week, in that bleed week, might be 70% fat, uh, about 20% protein, and then the fill is going to be carbs. So about 10% uh, of that's going to be carbs. But we have to also remember that quantity and quali quality, and I'm sure you've talked about this uh, on the pod many times before, people are like 70% fat, like, but you know, really like two tablespoons of olive oil are going to get you there with your, you know, when we think about, uh, you know, the, the caloric value of the, um, uh, of the macronutrient fat. So we want to think about 70% fat protein as a general rule, when we're thinking about building our plate, the protein is about the size of your palm. Um, and then the carbohydrates, of course, if you're having things like green leafy vegetables, very nutritionally dense, but not necessarily calorically dense in the way that fat might be. So that I love that for the first week, uh, in that the first two weeks, actually of your cycle, we call this the follicular phase because it's all about developing the follicle you are much more resilient to macronutrient restriction. So a 70, 20, 10 breakdown, 70 fat, 20 protein, 10 carbohydrate, you're essentially restricting carbohydrates in that week. So your body is very, it's much more suited for a macronutrient restriction. It's also a nice week to fast. So if we, I'm sure you've talked about fasting um, on the pod as well. I love their, depending on the hormonal presentation of the woman, I talk about all the different types um, in the book, but this might be a nice, Nice week for uh, an inter, um, a, either an intermittent fast or a several day fast. You mm -hmm. can kind of, if you're new to fasting, this would be a wonderful week to try it because we don't have progesterone, uh, which is our um, hormone that we see in the luteal phase. She's not around yet. And that progesterone stimulates your appetite. So it's going to be much easier for a woman to fast in the first two weeks of her cycle than it is in the, in the latter half. Uh, so just that's a, a little big tip right there. So if you want to yeah. start fasting or complete a, a block fast three or more days, it's the first two weeks of your cycle that you can really maximize it and be strict with ketosis. So brilliant. Correct. Continue. 
Yes. So as we finish up the bleed week, so we finish up the bleed, let's call it four, you know, for most women, it's like five to six days. And then now we're starting to move into that second week. And I just call this the week before ovulation, because when we think about the purpose of your menstrual cycle, it's not to bleed, it's to ovulate. So, you know, sometimes I think the nomenclature, we have it a little, like we name day one as the bleed, but really ovulation is the main event. That's actually the point of your menstrual cycle is to release an egg, whether or not you want a child, you know, like whether or not this is a goal of yours, that's what your reproductive system is designed to do. So in this week, we see a couple of hormones now starting to make their debut. The first is now we start to see estrogen. She starts to rise at towards the end of week one. And then she makes this astronomical, uh, the concentration of estrogen will go from, you know, in week one, I've seen it as low as like five picograms per deciliter. I was saying this to you in the pre-chat. And then in week two, it can go, I've seen it as high in some women as like 600 picograms per so we're going from five wow. to six hundred right so there's a huge change in the concentration of estrogen and estrogen when we think about her function of course it's a trophic it's an anabolic hormone it's designed for growth so the reason why estrogen is increasing there is because we want to develop the follicle trying to get the follicle ready so that we can release the egg the other hormone that comes up uh, and kind of makes its like one and only debut is testosterone. Uh, well, not, not one and only debut. It's, it's constant throughout the cycle, but the peak is in this week. So we see testosterone peak. And I will often say, you know, without doing labs and I, I, there's, I see full value in doing labs, but a very crude measurement of whether or not your testosterone is, is normal is this week. You should see a change in your libido. Your interest in sex should go up. Like you should be, you know, I often joke, like, I'm like, I find myself like chasing my partner around the dining table. I'm like, let's go, you know, because this is the time where your testosterone's peaking and you should, you know, mother nature, she's like a wily smart minx, right? If you are having sex ahead of your, you know, the time that you are ovulating, the chance that there is going to be a sperm and an egg that are able to meet for, a fer for fertilization is going to be, you know, a higher. So the number one priority is survival. And that's, that's what right. the body it's wants reproduction. to do. Absolutely. So, so this is just to be clear, um, this is the days 14 to 21. Is that what you're referencing here? I No, a little earlier than that. So we, we ovulate somewhere between day 12 and 14 for most women. So I would say that we're right now we're talking about like day six to 13. Okay. Six to 13. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So we see testosterone rising and for women specifically, this is an important time at, well, I mean, it's always an important time to be thinking about muscle health and bone health. But as we take, if we take a, a long lens, if we're thinking about longevity for women, we want to be thinking about uh, bone density and we want to be thinking about muscle mass. So ladies, my peri perimenopausal ladies and my menopausal ladies, we want to be thinking about how we can keep your bones heavy and how we can keep your, uh, at least maintain your muscle mass or improve upon it. And there's two ways that you can do it. One is through resistance training, right? So we're giving a mechanical stimulus to the muscle to grow it. The other is chemically, and we can do that through the diet. So if you are, in, if you are having protein, this is going to activate um, some anabolic pathways. One is mTOR, the mammalian target of rapamycin like super fancy name. All it means is like, it's a growth pathway. Okay. Yep. Um, and if you are having, um, you know, a certain amount of protein at every meal, you're going to be continuously activating that. So I like in this week, uh, to bring the fat down a little bit and pump up the protein. So I really like to bring the fat down from 70% that we saw in week one, maybe down to 50 or 40%. And then protein is about 40% of your meal. And then I like to just like oomph up the carbs, just a squeak. Like I like to bring them up to 20%. Because when you put, when you combine protein and carbs together, again, like carbohydrates, like the hormonal response to that is insulin. Again, insulin, even though I think sometimes it's been like demonized, um, it, it, again, anabolic, right? So it helps with the thyroid. It helps to bring substrates, you know, energetic substrates into the muscle cell for growing it. Mm -hmm. So I love this week for you to be increasing your protein. Um, and then the next week you switch it off, right? Cause we don't want, we don't want, pro we don't want these growth pathways on all the time. Um, because when you do that, then you, you sort of lay the, la the landscape for, you know, 
all everything to grow and we don't want things growing all the time like cancer cells and we don't want all those things growing so we want to be able to um i'll i'll steal this from dave asprey i just uh, interviewed him and he talked about mtor as like a spring so like we can push down on the spring you know so we like restrict protein restrict carbs restrict car and then when you have protein you sort of allow the spring to pop up and then again you can start to push down on it again so i, I thought that was a really nice an analogy so i'm uh, i will credit it where it's yeah. due it comes shout from out, asprey shout out to dave that's a brilliant analogy i love that one yeah. So that's week two. And then week three. So this is now after ovulation. So now we've ovulated, we've had luteinite. There's um, another hormone that comes up. It's called LH or luteinizing hormone helps release the egg from the follicle. And now the egg, like the queen she is, is just kind of hanging around waiting for sperm. Right. Yeah. Um, but now the entire hormonal landscape is going to change. Right. So now we are less, um, uh, you know, what we talked about fasting and macronutrient restriction in those first two weeks, these second two weeks, it's, it's not that it's impossible. It's just more uncomfortable. And what I have found with, you know, this is true for men and women, if something is uncomfortable and you're asking someone to do it all the time, you know, like the, the adherence to the practice is going to be much less than if it's a bit simpler and a bit more easy to integrate into everyday life. So just keep in mind that you can still fast. And there are ways that I talk about in the book that you can fast. If you are, you know, someone who's estrogen dominant or that you are androgen dominant, there are different, you know, uh, techniques that you can, uh, that you can employ, but generally we like to like kind of back off on the aggressive fasting. We like to back off on the aggressive macronutrient, um, restriction. So that's, so that's two weeks before the, uh, the bleed week, right? You that's wanna, right. Uh, if you, so for example, if they're doing, if somebody's doing OMAD, right, the first two weeks, then you would kind of scale that back down to like a 16, eight, you would do more of a, an aggressive. Uh, yeah. And I would even, I would even scale it down to like, you know, sometimes the week before, you know, in week four, which we'll get to in a moment, I'm doing a 12, 12 because a 16, eight is too much for me. Um, so you might find as a woman that even a 16, eight might be, uh, and I find that that's very easy to do in the first two weeks. You may find, you know, depending on your stress levels, if you're homeschooling as I am right now, if you're, you know, working from home, you're spending hours and hours in front of the, you know, on zoom calls and stuff, uh, you may find that the, um, the 16, eight even might, can be a little like, overly aggressive as well. So for a lot of women, I'll say, you know what, just like, it's okay. Like give yourself permission to do a 14, 10, like it's fine. Yeah. You know, like the, you're still getting a lot of the benefits that you would on a 16, eight. Um, it's just, you're just allowing yourself a little bit more flexibility. And for women in general, um, we want to be cognizant that we are much more sensitive. Like our, like, if we just think about the, the mitochondrial concentration in the ovaries, it's a hundred thousand mitochondria per cell. So you compare that to a hepatocyte, which has 2000 mitochondria, you, you know, a myocyte, like a, a cell in the heart, you know, it's 5,000, 5,500, like your, your mitochondria are like your, your ovarian mitochondria are like your eyes. They are sensing the environment, whether or not you are aware of them doing that. So they are wow. very, very sensitive to changes in, um, in, in, you know, fat, in food and macronutrients, etc. So you don't want to piss them off. <laughs> <laughs> make sure that you are loving up on your ov ovaries. So is that um, the highest concentration in the body? In the, in the body? Yes. What yeah. about for guys? Uh, for guys, I would, if I, I don't know this offhand, but I would, if I had to guess, I would say it would be the testes, but yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know exactly. Yeah, so I, I want to find out. That's an interesting yeah. question. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so we're in week three now. So now what I like to do is I like to, um, add in. So, so I like to return to a ketogenic, uh, diet. So that's 70, 20, 10 that I talked about. However, um, I like to add in resistant starches and I'm, sh I'm I don't know if you've talked about resistant starches on the pod before, but I am such a huge fan of them because especially for women, because what's happening in, in week three and into week four is now we see progesterone. So progesterone progesterone, pro gestation, pro pregnancy. That's our pro pregnancy hormone. She is going to stimulate your appetite. So she's going to make you hungrier. She is going to slow down your bowels. So you are digest, you may find that you are a bit more distended, a bit more gassy, not as often like your bowel movements are not happening as often as you, um, as you want. So we want to be thinking about, and then the other thing is cravings, right? So we always hear like women that are like, you know, 
chocolate's better than sex. You know, like I'll have the chocolate yeah. all day, every day. Or some women also will say I have really salt, very salty um, cravings. Like they want mm -hmm. like the chips and that kind of thing. Umami cravings. Yep. Exactly. So a way to help ameliorate that is by integrating resistant starches into the diet. So really quick uh, review. Don't need to be quick. Go, go deep into it. We, re we really haven't covered res resistant starches that much. So <gasps> oh, explain good. this. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited. Okay. So I want to briefly interrupt this interview with Dr. Stephanie Estima to say thank you so much for reaching this point of the video. We're super grateful. If you haven't hit the thumbs up button yet, please do so. And if you're not subscribed to the channel, hit the subscribe button with the bell. So you're notified when we go live, release a new video, release new content for you, which we do every single week. Also take a moment to check out the episode sponsors, Purity Coffee and Pure Form. Purity Coffee is the best keto coffee in the world, mold free, tested for heavy metals, they're delicious. We have a coupon code for you as well. And then Pure Form is the best alternative to toxic fish oil. And we have a coupon code for you as well. Check that down below. All right, let's get back to the conversation with Dr. Stephanie. So a resistant starch, you know, if you think about the name, it's, it's what is it? It's a starch that resists digestion. So when you are consuming a resistant starch, it cannot be broken down by the microbiota in the small intestine, which is where your carbohydrates typically are broken down fats, all that kind of stuff. Um, what happens is these starches go unmodified and they will go into the large intestine. And now this is going to be a food source for the microbiota in the large intestine. Why is this important? Because in the chowing down of the, uh, of the resistant starch, your microbiota are gonna give you a gift. They're gonna give you a short chain fatty acid called butyrate. So if you're someone who's interested in getting into ketosis, of course, an SCFA is going to increase your levels of ketosis, right? If you have more butyrate, you're going to be able to get into ketosis a little easier. But the great thing about it is it helps with your sleep. So how many women complain about sleep in week three and four, right? They're getting hot and, you know, uncomfortable and they're waking up and they have more anxiety. So it helps with your beauty sleep. It helps repair the, um, the lining of the gut. So if you are someone who naturally has digestive issues and you find that those are like, that's amplified in the, in that second week of this, uh, the second two weeks of your cycle, you're going to find that supplementing with resistant starches, what they, they've been shown to do butyrate specifically is it helps with the hyperpermeability in the gut. So mm. normally when we look at the gut lining, it should be like nice, tight, uh, nice, tight junctions, like food and stuff can't get through. But if you have been under stress or you're experiencing anxiety or sympathetic tone or like an Pesticides, increased, herbicides, all the, mold, all the things, yeah. all the toxins, all the things. So you're going to start opening up those junctions. So butyrate helps repair that. So those are two big things that women complain about, right? It's like sleep and cravings. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I've noticed specifically with keto is if you're a woman who's tried keto, what I found is often about week, like week one, two, they're like, oh yeah, I'm so good. And then week three, they're like, I don't know what it is, but I, I just want pizza. I don't care. Uh -huh. I don't care how many fat bombs I have. It doesn't matter. I just want carbs. And that is a distress signal from the, the microbiota in your large intestine, because they are, we are so, women are so sensitive to changes in the nutrient composition of the diet that your microbiota are like, we're starving. We're getting no carbs. You're going to eat a bowl of spaghetti if it's the last thing we do. But if you feed them the resistant starches, of course, now they're fed, they're happy, and, they're, and the, those cravings go away. And the resistant starches, do they kick you out of ketosis? Do they give you a big glucose spike? No, the great thing about them is that they don't, they are not broken down. Like, so I said, they're not broken down in the small intestine. So they don't actually count, you know, if we're, if you're counting your carbs, they don't count towards your carbohydrate, um, intake and, um, free I, carbs. What free carbs? Yeah. <laughs> free carbs. I know. It's so great. Uh, I will say, um, you can get this almost. So I typically use a, um, like a green bananas or a green banana a flour is a really good source of resistant starches. So if you, if you know, like you put a green banana on your counter, like yeah. over the course of the week, it's going to kind of go yellow. And then if you leave it, it's like brown spots. And by the end of the week, it's black. So what's happening there is you're having resistant starches 
uh, they're becoming cleaved as the, as the banana ripens. And that's what moves it from the green color to the yellow color. And of course the yellow to the brown and, and the black. So green banana, or I actually like green banana flower, which is, um, I just put it in my shakes because it kind of has a banana -y taste to it. I heard, um, I heard that you, uh, used to say it was disgusting, but you had some, some of your, uh, people oh my who, gosh. Who actually enjoy yeah. it. <laughs> it's funny. I hide it. Okay. So I hide it in my shakes. I have some people, so I've, I've run this keto ketogenic program for several years. And, um, I, I can't remember how it came up. I was like telling some, like maybe it was a new member. I was like, Oh, you don't want to drink it in water. It's like gross. And I had so many members like, Oh my God, that's like the best way. I love drinking it that way. So I don't like it in water, but a lot of, a lot, I mean, I, I go with what the market tells me. So like, my, you know, my clients were like, this is great in water. So you can have it in water. Um, I, I hide it in a shake, but it's, it, that's like a personal. <laughs> right. So preference. whatever your yeah. preference is, go, you know, give it a shot. Uh, what yeah. else? What are some other resistant starches? Uh, green plantains. So like cousin of the bananas, uh, raw potatoes as well, or raw potato starch. So you can get the starch, which is very, like you can find that in any grocer. Um, and, and you can even have even cold rice, truly like you can, uh, when we, you know, heat up rice, we are cleaving all of those starchy bonds, like all those carbohydrate bonds. Right. But then when you take the rice and then you put it in the fridge, you're, uh, there's like a crystallization, uh, process that happens and you form resistant starches. So a really nice thing for women, especially women who have trouble sleeping or, you know, maybe they're perimenopausal and they, they've been under like chronic low grade stress. And by that, I mean like child rearing and sleepless nights. And many of us right now are home homeschooling because schools are closed and, you know, there's a lot of stress happening, a little bit of cold rice with maybe, you know, some MCT or olive oil or something in the evening is actually, it, it, it you know, the rice will, it, it's going to kick you out a little bit of ketosis, but then you'll get right back into it over the course yeah. of the evening and it's going to help you sleep. Yeah. And that's, that, that's a good thing. So what, how much, how much is a little rice? What would you recommend? Oh, I'd probably say like a quarter to a half cup of rice. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Like a nice little snack. That sounds good. I want some right now, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> any any other sources of resistant starches that you like? Um, those are kind of the big ones. Um, if any other come to mind while I'm talking, those are those are the ones that I often okay. that I recommend the most. Um, and then the last, the last part of the cycle is for the fourth week. So this is like, do or, this is like peak week, right? It's like do or die. We are having a baby or we're not. So progesterone reaches her peak here at about day 21, day 22. So right at the beginning of week four, um, and I actually, if you were to do a blood draw on a woman in this week, you will find absolutely everything is down. So you will find her blood glucose, glucose levels are down. Her amino acids are down, her glutathione, her vitamin D, like all of the things, because your body is literally taking all of your substrates for energy and nutrients and minerals and throwing it into your endometrium. It's like, we got to get this thing ready. That's fascinating. So if this, yes. so if a woman did blood work that week and they, they see lower than usual numbers, mm -hmm. that could be what's happening right there. Correct. Lipids are down. Like everything is down. Like your body is literally taking these things and putting it into the endometrium to be able to thicken up that lining. So this week I love to relax again on the keto and actually pump up the calories. So I do not think, um, it is, uh, and I know this can be hard. Like some women are like, ah! more calories, like, you know, cause we're, we're so, we're so conditioned to caloric, like, you know, eat less, move more. It's like, we have to always calorically restrict. We always have to, yeah. but I promise you, if you push back against mother nature, you are going to clear out the cabinet. Like you're going to clear out the pantry anyway. Like your body will drive what it needs. It is going to find a way. So you might as well nourish your cells with more green leafy vegetables, with root vegetables, with squashes, you know, whatever is in season or whatever other foods that you like to consume rather than because, and this is what happened to me. Like I was like, no, I'm like, I'm like, you know, I'm a little man. I'm going to like push through it. And then I would like eat the cookies, the chips, the crackers, right. you know, like cleaning out the Ben and Jerry's from the freezer. And I'd be like, what happened? Like, what's wrong with me? And there's nothing wrong. There was nothing wrong with me. I was just not honoring, you know, my female physiology. I wasn't honoring my own, you know, rhythm and cadence. So, um, so women, I like this week again to pump up the protein, pump up the carbs, maybe bring the fat down, but the total calories I love to like, just, you know, pad another like 10 to 15% calories that the woman is normally uh, consuming through the month.
Mm, that's so good. I, I love that you shared that because that's what I tell my, my female clients as well. It's those five to seven days before the cycle to not worry about the calories. Actually, let's get out of ketosis. Let's have these the squash, the sweet potato, the fruit. Yeah. Let's intentionally get out of ketosis. And then once the cycle hits, that bleed week, you go right back into it. Yeah. And you were probably miserable too when you were like, I got all the willpower in the world. I'm not going to have this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay in ketosis. And, you, and then eventually you just cracked. Right, exactly. And it's funny because women have, um, you know, I, I was in private practice for many years and I just like women, we like to blame ourselves, right? Like we do a program that doesn't necessarily take into consideration our cyclical nature. And if it doesn't work for us or we can't maintain it, we're like, well, it's me like something wrong with me, or I don't have the willpower or I, there's something broken about me. And I, I just, you know, I, my hope with this book, I mean, it's, um, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, meta, you know, metabolism and body composition. I talk about training on your cycle, supplementing all the things, but my hope is that it's a bit of a feminist book in that women give themselves the permission to say, okay, like I am not a little guy. Like I'm not just a smaller archetype of a man with, there's nothing wrong with me. I have just, I just flow differently. Like I just have a different cadence than, you know, my husband or my brother or my, you know, f you know, my accountability partner, you know, whatever it is. And that forgiveness and that softening into the fact that we are different and we have to honor that difference and celebrate it. It's um, beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. Yes. It's a beautiful thing. Agreed. So, okay. That was such a masterclass for the cycling <laughs> women. Is there anything else they should know before we move on to postmenopausal women? Um, yeah. My, my biggest piece of advice is the more that you attune to your, the more that you learn to listen to your body, the more you'll actually like, so I'm, I'm providing guidelines, but you might find that you really like to increase your fat in the week before your, you know, like the, the week before your period. So these are, you know, good guidelines that I've derived from, you know, 16 years in private practice and thousands of women online. These are sort of the best practices that I have extrapolated from that data, but you might, you know, this, that doesn't mean that you have to do it exactly my way. Right. So you are an individual unique and beautiful. Um, so like, feel free to play, like, feel free to like say, I'm going to give myself like four months and play with a couple different things and see how I feel, because that's actually, you know, when you start to develop a better relationship with yourself and learn how to appropriately respond and care for yourself, I mean, that's, that's the big goal, right? Yes. Weight loss. Yes. All those things. But when you start to really just feel good in your skin, like that's, that's the thing. That's the, you know, that's the Holy grail that I think, um, I would want all women to be able to, um, to achieve. Amen. Uh, that's, that's what it's about. It's not about weight loss. It's not about tackling a symptom. It's about getting to the cause right. and developing, developing an in, this relationship with your body. I love that. Cause I was, I was, um, a personal trainer for many years. I used to own a CrossFit gym here in Miami. And I used to preach that whole eat every two to three hours, you know, get into a calorie deficit. And then I realized there's really, I'm doing my clients a disservice. It's a real distraction to what really matters, which is developing this relationship with the body, understanding cellular health. So I love that you teach it this way. A couple more follow-up questions before we move on to the postmenopausal ladies out there. Sure. What are some ways to track the monthly cycle? Are there some apps that you recommend? I use Clue. Um, I know that there are many out there, though. So there, I mean, the the first, if there's like one, you know, if someone's listening and they're like, God, this is like too much information. I don't know where to start. The first thing that you should do is get information about where you are in your cycle. And I didn't track my cycle for years. I had no idea. I was like, I think I'm supposed to like sometime in the next week. So it's really, you know, for you to know the days, right? Like how long is your cycle? How long does your period last? And then you can start tracking within the app often. Like Clue, I really like it. They have, um, you know, like what's your skin, like what's your bowel movements, like what's your mood, like what's your energy, like, so you can start tracking and you can start to understand your own pattern, right? So, you know, women, we all have, you know, pretty much the same parts, right? But we are all going to operate slightly differently based on our genetics and our environment and our experience in life and our epigenetics. So we want to be really having a good understanding of what our own cycle looks like. So the first action step for anyone is tracking your cycle and really understanding the ebbs and flows. And you'll start to be able to see as you're in your cycle, like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm feeling a little bit more, you know, sprightly today. And maybe that's because I'm in week two and, that, you know, or maybe I'm feeling a little bit more weighed down and I'm tired. And I remember there was, um, 
I was trained. It was a couple of months ago. I was like, I it was doing leg. It was a leg day for me and I was training and I was like, I don't know what the hell it is, but I'm just bagged. Like I usually do, I, like I do my four sets and I do my thing. And I went, I was like, where am I again in my cycle? I went in and I was like, oh, day 27, yeah. that's why. <laughs> but if I didn't have that information, I would have been like, what's wrong with you today, Steph? Like, why can't you just like punch out this damn workout? Like we planned this, you know, like you have this like internal narrative where you're like, just do it. But uh -huh. when you have the permission to rest or you have the, you have the understanding of where you are, it can give you a lot more information in terms of what you need to do to respond to yourself appropriately. Mm, well said. So if that happened seven days later, you would have been beast mode. Yeah. Oh yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> one, one more question is, um, okay. What about the, the cycling woman mm -hmm. who did 28 days strict keto? She got fat adapted. She's, you know, having 0 0.5, 0 0.8 ketones but she might be still insulin resistant, type two diabetes. And of course, this is not medical advice at all, but should they limit the carbohydrates and have more protein? How would they do the keto, the, I call it keto flexing, the carb flexing. Keep, yeah. So if someone has a metabolic, if there's some metabolic derangement, like there's type two diabetes, or even if she's pre-diabetic and she has, you know, metabolic syndrome and there's, I would, I would still want to be imparting the, um, the therapeutic intervention of that 28 days. And she might want to repeat that. So that cycle can be repeated one or two. I have often found women uh, in my program when and they have finished the first cycle, they're like, you know, I still feel like I need to go at this again. So you'll kind of know at the end of that month, you say, okay, I have a little bit more weight to lose or, you know, I want to, I want to improve my insulin sensitivity. So you can, of course, do your, you can redo your labs, like your fasting insulin, your fasting blood glucose. Uh, hopefully you have a CGM. So you have a bit more mm -hmm. uh, information. Which is a continuous glucose monitor, if you're wondering what that is. Yes, 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 thank you. Um, so uh, you can also repeat that month. Um, and I have often for women who are, you know, if they classify as obese based on their BMI or their waist to hip ratio, then we will repeat that 28 day again. And so up to three, like up to three cycles I have found, uh, some women can find, you can find massive benefit up there. And then that's, you know, if we talk about three cycles, it's about 12 weeks, mm -hmm. right? So if we're talking about, you know, becoming fat adapted, that's about the drop range. Like maybe it's, a, you know, eight to 12 weeks for most people is where we see that, you know, that flexibility in being able to meander between being glycolytic and lipolytic uh, relatively um, simply. So you can do that, you can repeat it. And then once you are, you know, you've sensitized your cells a little bit more to insulin and you'll know that by taking your fasting insulin, uh, you'll also know that with your blood glucose as well. Um, and you can also do challenges. Like I would give my, um, clients, like, um, we would do, um, either an oral glucose tolerance test, or I would just have them wear a CGM and then they would have, you know, a, 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 a meal. And then we'd look every half hour, we'd take a look at their, uh, blood glucose. So, you know, let's like, let's, let's say that someone had like a preprandial or pre-meal blood glucose at like call it 85, you know, milligrams per deciliter, 90, um, at the two hour mark, I, I at, at least want their blood glucose to be under 140 at the very least. Right. Ideally it's, a, it's back down to like 120. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, you can, you can, you can do little tests like that too. Right. So you can like eat a meal and then you can look two hours later and say, okay, where is my blood glucose now? Is my blood glucose still up really high or is it starting to, or is it starting to fall? So there's also little like little tests that you can do. As well. I, yeah. I love that. It's experimentation. So that's based off of the oral glucose test, not based off of just a regular meal. You can just do it with a meal. Like I would do an OGTT, but you can all, you can do it with meals as well. So you might have like maybe a carby meal. You can have like a protein and carb bolus and then sort of watch how your body responds to it as well. So you don't need to have like the, the, like the glucola is like the, it's like oh, disgusting. Yeah. That sounds yeah. disgusting too. It's gross, but you can, but you can just have a meal and, and look at it that way as well. Okay, great. I hope I asked all the questions that the, the, the cycling ladies want, wanted to hear. And if I didn't, I, I apologize, but I wanted to be really diligent with getting all the questions. So hopefully I got them all. Let's talk about the postmenopausal woman. How, how is she supposed to do keto? 
So this is a group that is near and dear to my heart. I love these ladies so much because I feel in many ways, the menopausal woman in society, we forget about them, right? Like we have all these words to like, it's like the spinster, the head, you know, all these like, and you know, when we look in Hollywood, we don't see, you know, I mean, maybe now I remember at last year, um, it was actually February last year uh, when J Lo and Shakira did the yeah. halftime show crushed and it. crushed it. And I was so excited because I was like, I've I've followed J Lo and both of those two women my whole life, you know, for many reasons. One, you know, Shakira is the same. Like I'm Portuguese and Lebanese, and she's Colombian and Lebanese, so she's like the closest kind of person to me that I've ever sort of come across in in Hollywood. Do you speak and- Portuguese? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I can understand it, but if I, I don't speak it, no. Okay. Just curious. Um, and same with JLo. Like she was one of the first women, like I grew up in like the Kate Moss era where it was like super thin thigh gap was like the status symbol. And I remember when JLo was a, a fly girl, um, yeah, she was a fly girl. I was like, oh my God, there's like a girl that looks, there's like a woman that looks at me. So she's now, you know, at the time she was like 50 maybe. And I was like, that is what I want. My 50, when I turn 50, that's what I'm going to like, maybe not, I'm not, maybe not going to do the halftime show, but like, <laughs> that, you know, I want to, that's what I want to you know, aspire to because I think as a society, we think, well, a woman is no longer sexual. She's no longer radiant. And I actually beg to, I beg to differ because now if you like right now I'm 43. So I know that I'm not having more kids. I have three children at home that I'm raising and like, but I'm still going to cycle until it's time for me to be menopausal. Right. But when you're menopausal, now that energy that you have been putting towards building of the lining every single month, now that can be used towards, you know, you don't have to waste it. It's not wasted energy anymore. Now you can use that energy to create the, uh, life or, you know, to follow some of the pursuits that you may not have been able to do when you were in your thirties and forties, cause you were raising young children. So this is a wonderful time. Like women are, you know, we are beasts of creation. We are animals that, you know, it, whether you are creating, you know, a human, right. Like using your, you know, your anatomy to create humans, or you can use your body to create and call in the things that are really exciting to you that will fulfill you on many different levels. So I, you know, I love to look at menopause as this, uh, you know, this like gold, like these golden years. So, um, for, I wanted to just say that because I think that I love it. Yeah. Cause women are not like, you know, we sort of, you know, in the movies, like we, like the woman is always like in a little sweater and she's, you know, not the right. sweaters, are, there's nothing wrong with sweaters, but you know what I'm trying to say? I like know what this, you're saying. My girlfriend's going to love to hear that. She preaches that same message. I'm going to, I'm going to share this with her later. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. So there, but there are some metabolic changes that we see, right? So as a woman is moving through uh, perimenopause and into menopause, a couple of things that we see, the first is that we tend to become more insulin resistant. So what that means is that your cells are not as uh, sensitive to the effects of insulin. So you will have to, usually we see, we, what we start to see clinically is we will start to see an increase in her blood glucose without her really changing much. The other thing that we notice that sort of pairs along with that, it's related to it, is that her muscles also become resistant. It's called anabolic resistance. And what that means is it actually takes more for a muscle to grow uh, when she is 50 and beyond versus when she's underneath, you know, when she's like 42 or 32 or whatever. So, so does, does testosterone decline along with that? Is that why? Yes. Yes. So what we, in late peri, so perimenopause sort of has two like general phases. The first is where women tend to, in earlier perimenopause, a woman will tend to be more uh, estrogen dominant. So we start to see progesterone decreasing at about the age 35 and beyond, you know, progesterone in a woman will start to decrease. So that provides the opportunity for her to become more estrogen dominant. And that's all the PMS type of symptoms that we were talking about before. Now, what it flips kind of in the late 40s and into the 50s. So we have the first stage of perimenopause, estrogen dominant. Second stage is where everything starts to come down. So T starts to come down, estrogen starts to come down. And there's a whole host of symptoms that sort of go along with that. And with those things, with a decrease in testosterone, of course, it is, you have to work harder to maintain what you got. So for a menopausal woman, a ketogenic diet is beautiful. 
However, we were talking, uh, if you recall, we were talking in that week two, how I like, you know, in testosterone in a, in a reproductive woman, when her testosterone peaks and her estrogen peaks, I like to pair that with more protein. I actually like to apply that cycling concept to a menopausal woman as well, because again, we don't want to have the growth hormone on all the time. So we want to sensitize the muscles to higher protein. It's like that spring that I was talking about. So we want to like, let it go with like high protein and then bring it back down again for a week and then let it go and then bring it back down. So for a menopausal woman, it's very similar to what we talked about with a reproductive in, in for a woman who's menstruating or cycling. But the only big difference is in that week four, she doesn't now need to increase her calories because there's no endometrium that's being built up. Mm. So she can protein cycle. So she can have one week keto, one week high protein, one week keto, one week high protein. So her insulin levels uh, you know, in terms of the, in terms of the food that she's taking in is going to remain relatively low. There'll be a little bit of a blip when she increases her uh, protein, but that's because we're trying to, we're trying to drive muscle protein synthesis. We're trying to get her muscles um, to grow. And hopefully she's also pairing those higher protein weeks with training. So I'm a really big proponent for resistance training for women of all ages, but particularly my ladies in menopause, even if you've never lifted a weight, start doing it. You could just use your own body weight to start yeah. because again, when we think about uh, bone density and bone health, you know, resistance training or just using your own body weight is going to drive the, uh, what we call the osteoblastic to osteoclastic ratio. So it's basically the cells that are um, involved in bone growth. Those are the blasts, the osteoblasts. They are going to outnumber the clastic cells or the, the cells that are involved in breaking them down. So the more that you do squats or you take your dog for a walk, like anything that's weight bearing, you are going to drive more bone growth. And of course, you know, muscles and bones are sisters, right? So you are training your muscles. You're also going to be improving the, uh, the density and the quality, um, of your bones. And we've all had, or we've all heard of stories. I mean, my grandmother, this happened to her as well, like slipped and fell. It was like icy. She was, you know, in Montreal, like cleaning her, you know, pat, like her little porch area slipped and fell, cracked her hip. Right. Mm. We, we don't, we want to avoid that. And when we see that, when we see estrogen decrease in late perimenopause and into menopause, of course, Estrogen is trophic. It is, you know, we need estrogen to keep our bones dense. So you, while you may not necessarily have that naturally being produced from the ovaries anymore, you can um, improve your bone density through lifestyle changes like the resistance training and also getting your stress under control as well. Because after menopause, your main source of estrogen is going to be from your adrenal glands um, as well as your adipose tissue. So you want to make sure that your adrenals are, are fortified and they're strong. Mm, that's so good. Okay. So is the goal on the protein, the high protein week to get out of ketosis? Is that what we want? Yeah. You don't have to be in, I, I don't believe that a woman should be in ketosis all the time. Um, I agree. I actually, I, for men and women, by the way. I would agree with that as well. I think that there's, there's a time and a place for therapeutic, like nutritional ketosis to be able to talk about, you know, to be able to induce that metabolic flexibility that we talked about, you know, for weight loss, for, you know, helping with the production of ketone bodies, et cetera. But I don't think that a woman and, you know, to add on what you're saying, or a man should be in ketosis all the time. I think it's much easier for a cyclical approach to that in and out, in and out so that we can continue to sensitize cells and to drive, you know, in, in this case for women, uh, muscle, like lean muscle mass and bone density. So could you speak on for those who are probably, um, watching and listening who have been in ketosis, whether it's a guy or a gal for let's say over a year, they've been in strict ketosis right now. Could you really just map out the relationship between the thyroid health, right? T4 needs to convert to T3. Mm -hmm. What helps make that conversion? Insulin. Could you, could insulin. you speak, could you speak yeah. about when you're chronically low insulin on mm -hmm. strict keto for too long, what that can do to the thyroid and maybe even slow down weight loss? 
Yeah. I mean, I think that when you are, uh, when you're strictly keto and you're, when your carbohydrate intake is very low, you actually become a little bit insulin resistant. <laughs> you yeah, when in I, a when different I, way. Yeah. In a different way. Right. So we want to think about all the good things that insulin does do. So one of the, one of the main things, as you correctly pointed out, is it helps convert our inactive, uh, thyroid hormone T4 to T3. And, you know, the thyroid, when we think about it, it, it in the context of metabolic health is sort of like the top of the pyramid, right? If like the, if the thyroid goes off, like everything disintegrates. So you do really have to be thinking about all the different things that insulin does do. Like it drives bone density, it drives muscle growth, it drives thyroid integrity and health. So I, if you are someone who has been on a very strict ketogenic diet and you've, um, you found really great benefits up to it. You, what you may find over time is that you may start to actually slide back a little bit, that you mm -hmm. may start to start to see weight gain creeping back up again, or your brain fog or your energy levels. And so for many people, because they have had that initial, like, well, when I first started keto, it was really good for me. I must be getting lazy. Like a lot of people will double down on the, key. you see this in all diets, by the way, like so, someone who goes vegan, they, or vegetarian in the first couple of months, they feel really, really great because, you know, partly because they're just having more plants than maybe they were before. But then over time, those benefits start to wane. So someone might say, well, what I have to do is I have to just become more vegan. I have to become just even more strict. Mm -hmm. So now I can't even have honey and now I can't even have the, and you end up absolutely decimating your metabolism. And the same is, I mean, uh, you know, I love, I have a lot of love, a lot of women, uh, who tend to be vegan, but you know, when I look at lab work, I mean, this is yeah. a different podcast, but, uh, I am very much pro animal products that are raised ethically, killed ethically, you know, grass, if you can, if you, if it's, you know, available to you to be having grass fed, um, meats, grass finished meats, uh, free run poultry, all those things. So, um, but uh, this is, I, this I is agree. A, I've seen a lot yeah. of labs too. And it's, it's scary. Even adding like just some grass fed ghee or some wild caught yes. fish on a vegan approach could really make a big difference to your point. Yes, but it's coming, kind of coming back to that keto, that person who's been on keto, the same sort of mentality can infect that kind of thinking. So we think, well, I felt really good in the first two months, four months, six months on keto. Why am I feeling? Oh, it must be because I'm, I'm, I'm becoming lazy or I'm not doing it the way that I used to. So we become more keto. And I think the, the, what I would like to maybe correct in that conclusion is maybe it's that you've run the course that the therapeutic intervention has, has had, and now you can become a little bit more flexible in your application of the ketogenic diet and your thinking. So, um, yeah, if you're someone who's been on it for a year, maybe it's time to start cycling protein, like cycling your protein, cycling your carbs, cycling your fat. Yeah. Yeah, that's a wake up call for a lot of people, but it, it makes sense. You know, all of our, every one of our ancestors did keto. They were in ketosis because their environment, but they didn't stay there long term. Whenever they had the opportunity, they didn't look at their tribe and say, you know, we're keto. We don't eat that. No, they would eat the fruit. They would eat the tubers. They would have the honey and they would get out of ketosis. And that's the, the way we were designed to be. We were actually designed to cycle in and out of states of ketosis. And you just explained how to do that very, very well. What role, before we land the plane here on this awesome interview, mm -hmm. what role does, you talk, talked about stress, but what, what role does sleep play with all of this? Oh my goodness. It's the first domino. You cannot, you cannot keto your way out of bad sleep. Like mm -hmm. you got, you got to sleep. Um, That's good. I agree. Yeah. You, I mean, I am such a, and for women, if we kind of want to keep this as a female, so yes. like female specific, women actually have longer sleep cycles than men. So by about 30 to 45 minutes, uh, we tend to need a little bit more sleep, especially around our period. There's a lot of like a long, like around the initiation of men are like the menstruation because we are, there's so much happening, right? Like the endometrium thickening up and where all the resources and there's a lot of like all your worker bees are working really hard to make sure that you're you're ready to receive a fertilized um, egg. So we need to sleep. This is true for men and women, mm -hmm. but I am not a big fan of waking up early. And I know that I piss off a lot of people when I say that, but 
you have to break up with the 4 a.m. club. You have to break up as a woman, like sleep in, because if you are not, and I know that that's hard and it's not always, you know, it's not always available. You may have young children or you're breastfeeding, you're, you know, you have a newborn up overnight, but I, I just love the um, idea of divorcing yourself from any one school of thought, because there's some, you know, when you think about morning routines and, you know, you'll hear people say, I, you know, i wake up really early in the morning and I journal and I have ideation time and I go for an hour workout and I do this. Those are usually it's men who are talking about this. And if, and if those men have children, it's the woman who's taking care of the kids while he's having this morning routine and like all kudos to you, right? Like if that works for you and that works in the rhythm of your family, like, you know, and that's great. But a woman will hear that message and there's not a lot of women, you know, women influencers or, you know, women of influence who are saying, Hey, you know, like that's kind of sexist. Like it's not like for me, my morning routine when my children were little was my children waking me up. Like I'd have my little toddler, she, like he'd kind of, you know, come into my bed and be like, mommy, mommy, mommy. And that was my morning routine, you know? So, and it's, and it's morphed over time, right? My kids sleep in now I can, I can wake up and, you know, get in a workout, but just to have this idea that as a woman, usually you're going to be the primary caregiver in your family and your morning routine and therefore your sleep is going to change with time. So, you know, sleep the as much as you can you have to prioritize it whether that means going to sleep earlier whether it's sleeping in um whether it's like getting rid of your morning routine so thank you for letting me go on that little soapbox because yeah. some people are just like oh my god what is she saying but you know yeah. it, it's it's important for a woman to know that her she's not a man like she's not a little man like when i was i'll, I'll give you a, an example when i was in chiropractic practice we were talking about i used to be part of this mastermind and um you know, I would be among these great chiropractors, like these men that I would just absolutely like their brilliance, their intelligence, the change and the positive influence that they were making in their communities. And some of them were seeing like thousands of people a week. And it's because they had, you know, we, I had this like little secret nickname for them. They had like Cairo wives. They had wives at home who would do everything for them. They would run, they would sometimes be even the office manager in the, in the clinic and they would take care of the kids and they'd cook all the meals and all the things. And I, I, I didn't have a Cairo wife. Like I was the wife, you know, so I had to run the clinic and be the primary caregiver for my children. And while my clinic did very well, it was very successful. It was never like, I never saw thousands of people a week because it just, I couldn't work that much. I had to be at home with my babies. So, um, yeah. So like, sleep is important, right? It's like, I'm never going to say sleep's not important. You know, we need to every night you need to, you know, there's a, a system called the glymphatic system, which is basically going to clean out all like the brain crud that you accumulate over time, the tile tangles, the beta amyloid plaques and all of that. Um, but as a woman, you may find, especially if you have young children, that it may not necessarily be possible for you to sleep all the way through the night. You may adopt a biphasic model where you are sleeping, you know, partially through the night, you wake up maybe to breastfeed or, you know, soothe the child who's had a nightmare, and then you can sleep in a little bit longer. But the, the point is for women is to remain, remain flexible. Yeah. Sleep is the Swiss army knife of health. It's so yeah. true. Builds the yep. foundation. And if you're waking up early to work out and you're sacrificing sleep, man or woman, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> I agree. You get the yeah. sleep and uh, you're going to, everything else will work that much more efficiently. When you, mm. when you upgrade sleep, keto, the fasting, the supplements you're taking upgrade automatically. But when you are slacking on sleep, then all that can't be efficient. You're, you're going to be frustrated. You're going to be stressed out. You're going to have higher levels of ghrelin. That's been proven. You're going to have higher levels of cortisol. That's been proven. And it's just not going to be fun. So I love that. I'm with you with that message, message, even though I'm a guy, I do prioritize sleep. So this has been so much fun, Stephanie. Oh my gosh. We geeked out. And uh, I'm so grateful for this conversation. I want to, before I ask you to share where they could look you up and all of your resources, I want to acknowledge you for just the work that you put out there for your, your book that's coming out tomorrow and uh, your podcast and just your, your knowledge. It's, it's clear that you put a lot of effort, energy, and resources into just studying how the body works at a cellular level. And I love how you use analogies and anchors to really help people understand how this works because it could be 
could be a, a mouthful when you're talking about these scientific terms like mechanistic target of rapamycin and autophagy, but you break it down so well. So I'm grateful for your work. I, I want all the keto campers to go check you out and get your book. We're going to put links down below. What are some uh, social media resources that they could find you on? Uh, so I, you can find me on Instagram. So it's at Dr. Stephanie Estima. That's S T E P H A N I E E S T I M A. And I just joined clubhouse. So I don't know yeah, what's going to happen. Too. I don't know what's going to happen there, but everyone keeps talking about it. So I'm on clubhouse. Uh, Stephanie Estima is my handle there. And uh, so those are kind of the two main social, uh, platforms that I'm on. And then you can always go to hello, club, which is our, uh, main membership site for uh, women who want to become Bettys. And of course the podcast, uh, you can, anywhere you listen to podcasts, anywhere you listen to Ben, uh, you can find me, um, as well. We'll put all of that down below in the YouTube video and also the podcast. So go check out Dr. Stephanie, go get her book. You're going to love it. Even if you're a man, I can't wait to read the book and I'm a guy. I'm just going to, I'm going to send you a right. copy as soon as I get yes. my first. Yeah. I'm going to send you a, send you a copy right now. Show, show the, don't you have the cover there? I want to show, do, the YouTube, yeah. show the YouTubers. All right. My YouTubers, this Look is what it looks like. So it's a beautiful photo of Dr. Stephanie in a nice dress with a pink background <laughs> and it got that killer subtitle. I love it. Thanks. Pink and purple, like my favorite two colors. So. I love it. Well, thank you for the <laughs> conversation today. This was a lot of fun. I know the audience enjoyed it. So I appreciate thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. I hope you geeked out on that interview with Dr. Stephanie. Go subscribe to her podcast. Go check her out on the social media platforms. Me and her do a lot of clubhouse rooms. We, we interact on clubhouse as well. So you can follow her on there. Follow me on there and show her some love. Go pre-order her book. It's out tomorrow if you're watching this interview on the day that it was released. It's out tomorrow. It's called The Better Body, and you could get it by going to the link down below. If you're a woman, this is a must read for you, uh, and go so show her some love on her social media because she's doing amazing work. If you haven't hit the thumbs up button here on this video, please do so. Uh, if you got any value from it and text this video to a friend, post it on social media, spread it all across the world. So every woman needs to watch this video. It'll really help them out. If you didn't watch my previous interview I did just a couple days ago with Dr. Mindy Peltz, we dove deep into fasting for ladies out there. Whether you have a menstrual cycle or you're postmenopausal, Dr. Mindy gives you that breakdown week by week on how to do fasting, the six styles of fasting, and of her concept called the fasting circle. So you can watch that video right now by sticker tapping the screen right there, and we'll see you in that next video.